Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I am president of the National Press Club and a reporter with Bloomberg News. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through programming with events such as this while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today and those of you in our audience. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, I'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. You can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer period. I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Kevin Wensing, retired U.S. Navy captain, now with the Sequoia Group. Lynn Cooper, weekly technology contributor to Black Enterprise and founder and chief social officer of Socially Ahead. Christopher Chambers, professor of media studies at Georgetown University. Cindy Hall Berlin, president and CEO of Good360. Skipping over the podium, Myron Belkind, the National Press Club vice president an adjunct professor at George Washington University and the former AP bureau chief in Tokyo, New Delhi, and London. Skipping over our speaker just for a moment, Mark Hamrick, Washington bureau chief for Bankrate.com, the 2011 National Press Club president and the speakers committee member who organized today's event. Thank you, Mark. Tam Harbert, freelance journalist covering business and technology and the chairwoman of the Press Club's freelance committee. And Alan Schlafer, president of the Wharton Club of Washington, D.C., and the member who assisted in making today's luncheon happen. <laughs> Our guest today enjoyed a fascinating and successful career involving technology, politics, and most recently, as you will soon hear, philanthropy. As many of our National Press Club members know, one of our priorities this year here at the club is to celebrate women's roles in our society. And so I'm particularly pleased that our guest today, Carly Fiorina, agreed to participate in our historic luncheon program. Born in Austin, Texas, Ms. Fiorina's own career began as a secretary working in a small business. What a journey she's had since then. As chairman and chief executive offer of officer of Hewlett Packard from 1999 to 2005, she was the first woman to lead a Fortune 20 company. For six straight years, she was named Fortune Magazine's most powerful woman in business. It was during her tenure at HP that the company acquired Compaq Computer, creating the world's largest personal computer manufacturer. After her departure, HP failed to capitalize on the move to mobile products as consumers' preferences shifted in favor of tablets and smartphones. Politics has also been central to our speaker's work in recent years, having played key roles in the Republican presidential campaigns of both John McCain and Mitt Romney. Ms. Fiorina ran unsuccessfully in a bid to unseat Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer in California, but she was triumphant in the biggest battle of her life as a survivor of breast cancer. During a recent interview, asked whether she might run again for office, she replied, never say never. She received her bachelor's degree from Stanford. She dropped out of law school, but made up, more than made up for that, by getting an MBA from the University of Maryland, as well as a Master of Science in Management from MIT. Since we are here at the National Press Club, we should mention as well that our guest is a best-selling author, having penned the memoir, Tough Choices. She was also a contributor to the cable channel Fox Business. So what's she been up to lately? Ms. Fiorina is now chairman of Good360, described as the world's largest product philanthropy organization. Based nearby in Alexandria, Virginia, Good360 was founded three decades ago, assisting firms to donate slow-moving, obsolete, or seasonal items to thousands of charitable organizations. 
These items include clothing, books, toys, personal care products, office and school supplies, and computers, among other things. We today will hear more about that work, and please help me welcome to the National Press Club, Carly Fiorina. Thank you and good afternoon. It's great to be with all of you, to have met already some new friends and to also see some old friends here as well. I was recently asked what I thought an entrepreneur was. In fact, a member of the press corps said to me, what is an innovator? And I had to think about that for a moment. But my answer was an entrepreneur, an innovator, is someone who can envision a different future. An entrepreneur is someone who dreams big and works long hours. An entrepreneur is someone who sees possibilities and by seizing those possibilities creates possibilities for others. And because it is almost the 4th of July, I also thought on the way here about what makes this country great. What's so special about this country? As you heard in the introduction, I began my career as a young adult uh, as a secretary. I graduated from Stanford University with a degree in medieval history and philosophy in the middle of a recession which meant that I was all dressed up and nowhere to go. <laughs> and so, like so many in my situation, I decided to go to law school, with all due respect to all the lawyers in the room. The only thing is I hated law school. And so I quit after a single semester, and in order to make a living, I went back to doing what I did while I was in college to help pay my bills. I was a heck of a typist. I went back to work as a secretary. I typed, I filed, I answered the phones for a little nine-person company. I have traveled all over the world, and it is true still to this day that it is only in the United States of America that a young woman typing and filing for a nine-person firm can soon, it only took 20-something years, become the CEO of one of the largest companies on earth. That is only possible in the United States of America. And it is possible here not because I'm so special. It is possible here because this place is so special. And it is so special because it was founded on a radical idea an idea that was radical in 1776, but it is still radical to this day. And the idea is that every human being has potential, that everyone has the right to fulfill their potential, that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or what you look like or what your last name is. Actually, all that matters is where you wanna go all that matters is that you have potential. All that matters is how you envision your own future. That was a radical idea, and it is a radical idea still, and it is inextricably linked with the power of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is the single greatest lever for fulfilling human potential, and for lifting people out of poverty that the world has ever known. And it is the genius of this country that we coupled political liberty with the opportunity to build your own future, to imagine your own future, to create something that you have a stake in so that you and your family are better off. Entrepreneurialism and innovation is a uniquely American gift. It is the secret sauce that makes this a special place.
And it is true because so many Americans got their start exactly the way I did. I started out in a little nine-person firm. An entrepreneur and his partner started that firm because they wanted to imagine a different future for themselves, for their families, for their community. And one day while I was typing and filing at my desk after six months of working there, those two partners came to me and said, you know, we've been watching you, and we think you could do more than type and file. Do you want to learn something about what we do? Do you want to find out something about the world of business? And because they took a chance on me, because they saw possibilities in me that I had not considered, I was able to envision a different future for myself. And that happens in America every day in communities all across this great nation. Wave after wave after wave of immigrant has gotten their start as entrepreneurs. And you don't have to be Steve Jobs to be an entrepreneur, although he is a great op entrepreneur. If you want to open the taqueria on the, con on the corner, you're an entrepreneur. If you want to open the deli, the dry cleaner, whatever it is, you are creating a better future for yourself, your family, and by extension, your community. Wave after wave of immigrant got their start there. And if you look at the statistics, you will see that women own small businesses, African American owned small businesses, Hispanic owned small businesses, Asian American owned small businesses have been historically the fastest growing segments in our economy. In other words, in this great country where we are defined by our potential. It is entrepreneurialism that lifts people up. Now, while entrepreneurialism may be uniquely American, and while it may be our country's genius to have provided the opportunity to start your own business and imagine your own future to more people than in any time and in any place in human history, Innovation and entrepreneurialism, I think, is a fundamentally human thing. I know this from my work with the One Woman Foundation, the One Woman Initiative, which I founded six years ago, and through my work today with Opportunity International. These are organizations that give a very, very small amount of credit to women in desperate circumstances. And what we know what we have found is if you give someone the chance with just a little bit of money, if you give someone the chance to build a better life for themselves and their families by building a business which they can own a stake in, progress happens. People lift themselves from poverty. Entrepreneurialism is a human drive. But it is in this country where it has seen its fullest flowering. Here we are on July 1st in 2013. What is the state of entrepreneurialism and innovation in this country? Well, I actually think the data is a bit alarming. I think entrepreneurialism is in trouble in this country. Allow me to give you a couple statistics. There are more small and new businesses failing and fewer starting at this time than at any time in the last 40 years. There are fewer small and new businesses starting and more failing than at any time in the last 40 years. This depressed state of entrepreneurialism, I believe, is why our economy is underperforming. It is why our economy grows at 1.7, 1.8, maybe 2%, maybe 2.5%. It is why our unemployment rate is stubbornly stuck at an unacceptably high 6 point something percent. Because if you also look at the data, you know that new and small businesses create two-thirds of the new jobs in this country and employ half the people. So if you have smaller, fewer small businesses starting, if you have more small businesses failing, you have an economy that is underperforming and fewer people with the possibility of that first job, in my case, 
or perhaps a first chance or a second chance. There was recently a survey published in the Washington Post, and in that survey, survey 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of small businesses said they felt government was hostile to their efforts. Not neutral, hostile. If you ask people why, you get answers like, it's just too hard. It's too complicated. I don't know how many of you saw a front page article in the Wall Street Journal describing what is now known as, they claimed, was a risk averse culture in the United States. The article quoted many statistics, but fundamentally what it said was, this is a place where people used to take pride in taking that risk, and now we're reluctant to do so. If you comb through all the data, what you kind of find out is that people are saying, you know what, the risk of failure is getting too high, and the reward for success is becoming too low. It is a bipartisan comment to recognize that our tax code is now tens of thousands of pages and it is way too complicated for any entrepreneur to wade through. It is a bipartisan comment to recognize that our regulatory environment has become so complex. There are thousands of regulations written into law every single year, but rarely, if ever, is a regulation ever repealed. And the consequence of that is a geologic sediment of complexity. This complexity, this thicket of regulation and taxation is literally in my view, and as represented by the data I just quoted, as well as other pieces of data, is literally choking the entrepreneurial life out of our economy. And this is of grave concern, or should be, to everyone, from liberal to libertarian and everyone in between. I recently had the uh, great pleasure to moderate a panel discussion at the Clinton Global Initiative among three very impressive female entrepreneurs. And as one of them noted, she said, you know, kids in school learn how to be employees. They don't learn how to be entrepreneurs. And I thought it was a really telling comment. How does Washington work? Well, you know, I grew up in big business, really big business. And I would say, again, not a partisan comment, I would say it is accurate to describe Washington as a place that works well if you're big. If you're a big business, it works really well, because guess what? You can hire legions of attorneys and accountants and lobbyists. In fact, all that complexity helps a big business a lot of times. If you're a big trade association, if you represent lots of votes, whether you're a union or a company or an association, Washington works pretty well for you because you have the resources and the time to wade through the complexity and let us speak the truth to, in some cases, manipulate that complicated environment to advantage you and your members. And if you are a politician, it's to your advantage as well because now your job becomes to represent people and to help them navigate through this thicket of complexity. But Washington doesn't work well if you're an innovator, an entrepreneur, who is so busy trying to build your future for yourself, for your family, and for your community that you do not have the time or the resources to navigate your way through this thicket. And so what the data says is, too many are just giving up. I'll never forget a luncheon that I had in Denver, and I was talking to a group of small business owners, and I was um, encouraging them to get more involved in the political process. It was a bipartisan group. And one of them finally said to me what was patently obvious. He said, Carly, we're too busy. We don't have time to figure it out. And of course, an entrepreneur and an innovator, a small business owner, they don't have time. They are literally spending all of their time 
trying to make it work. You ever heard that story of the frog in the boiling water? You know, if you throw a frog into a pot of boiling water, he will jump out to save himself. But if you put a frog in a pot of water and slowly turn the water up to a boil, that frog will boil to death. It happens so gradually that he doesn't realize until it's too late. And I worry that we are gradually year after year after year, creating an environment that is similarly choking the life out of this entrepreneurial economy, little by little, rule upon rule, regulation upon regulation. Let's talk for a moment about the nature of bureaucracies, because bureaucracies matter here in Washington. We're full of them. And because the big companies and the big associations and the big labor unions that do well in Washington are also big bureaucracies. Bureaucracies, by their nature, whether they're political or business, what characterizes a bureaucracy? It is a rules-based, tradition-bound institution that seeks to preserve itself and that over time rewards playing by the rules rather than judgment and initiative. These are not pejorative comments I'm making. They are factual comments. A bureaucracy is a rules-based organization. Again, whether it's business or politics. It is an organization that rewards playing by the rules. It is an organization that celebrates playing by the rules more than disruptive innovation. We have lots of bureaucracies, and over time, what happens in bureaucracies, whether they are in business or in politics, what happens in bureaucracies is they become inward-looking, insulated. Playing by the rules inside becomes more important than serving customers or constituents outside. And this, too, contributes to an environment where people not only lose faith in the institutions which have become bureaucracies, but conclude that those bureaucracies are hostile. Entrepreneurs give people a chance. Entrepreneurs gave me my first chance. In some cases, entrepreneurs give people a second chance and a third chance, and a fourth chance. And entrepreneurs aren't just about for-profit businesses. My whole life, I have been animated by the opportunity to help fulfill potential in myself and in others. And it is why I am so proud to be associated with an organization like Good360, which recognizes that civic society also helps lift people out of poverty and helps them fulfill their potential. And so rather than just have waste go into landfill, we work with good-hearted and smart-minded businesses with excess inventory and make sure that that inventory gets to people in need. So the charities, instead of worrying about whether or not their members or their needy uh, constituents have diapers for that week, can instead worry about helping those women. I'm proud to be associated with the National Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, a group of like-minded people who believe that it is vital that we restore entrepreneurship as a shared and enduring value in America. It is why I am proud to be engaged in microfinance here and around the world to help give people a chance to lift themselves and their families out of poverty. So, in the few minutes I have left, what do we do so we don't boil the frog to death? What do we do so that instead of choking the life out of this entrepreneurial economy, out of this very special place, we actually unlock the potential of all those frustrated entrepreneurs and innovators out there? Well, I think there are four basic policy prescriptions. And while I have been some might say critical of Washington. There are some small glimmers of hope here in Washington right now. First, we need tax reform. 
and not just lowering rates, although that's important since our tax rates are now the highest in the world, but radical simplification. Tax reform has bipartisan support now, but I am in particular heartened by the efforts of Senator Orrin Hatch and Max Baucus, two good friends of mine and two good men, who are starting with the fundamental notion that they are going to wipe out every loophole and deduction in the tax code. For years I have been saying, the only way to do this is to lower every rate and close every loophole. Because let's face it, the loopholes mostly benefit those in big. Maybe there are a few loopholes that you would let come back in, but what Hatch and Baucus understand is, if you say they all go, then the burden of proof is on those who must argue to put them back in. We not only need lower tax rates, we need radical simplification of this tax code so that an entrepreneur doesn't look at it and say, oh my gosh, I can't possibly understand 26,000 pages and give up before they start. Tax reform, we need immigration reform. We desperately need immigration reform. If you set aside the criminals who are coming in, or the people who are, have broken our laws, or the human traffickers. Why is it that people come to this country? Because they envision a better life for themselves and their families. Because they are desperate to imagine and create a different future than they have. And I hope that we are at a moment where bipartisan immigration reform is possible, and where we recognize that our legal immigration system is so fundamentally broken that we are hurting ourselves as a nation. This has to be the place, forever and for always, where hard-working people all around the world say, that's where I want to go. That's where I want to dream my dream and build something different for my future. Third, I think we need zero-based budgeting. Now, I know there's a lot of talk sometimes in Washington about a balanced budget amendment. I think actually that's less useful than saying we are going to ask every, every bureaucracy in the United States government to literally justify every dollar that they spend. That's what we do in business. I know as a business person, whether you're talking about a very small startup or a very huge Fortune 20 company, this is true. If you give an organization more money year after year after year, their performance will deteriorate. It will not improve. Because people lose the ability to prioritize. They lose the discipline to justify why they are spending money. They lose the incentive to explain clearly that they are trying to spend each and every dollar wisely and well. Zero-based budgeting where Congress has the opportunity to ask for justification for every dollar and the transparency that comes along with that. And believe me, it doesn't matter whether you're a liberal, a libertarian, or somewhere in between, we would be shocked at what we are spending money on. If you doubt what I just said, that more money doesn't mean better performance, think about what's going on in the Veterans Administration. It's not because people are ill-meaning. It's just because the way a bureaucracy works works against performance sometimes. The budget of the Veterans Administration has increased 45% in the last five years, and we would all applaud that. And yet the waiting time for veterans to receive disabilities has gone from 260 something days in 2008 to 400 and something days in 2013. Ergo, more money isn't better performance. Zero base budgeting. And finally, I would create a task force of small business owners and entrepreneurs. I know, somehow we'd have to keep their businesses going in the meantime. But their job would be to look at each and every regulation on the books today each and every one, and they would make recommendations about which to kill, which to modify, 
my guess is that we could do with at least 50% fewer regulations than we have today. It's not that regulation isn't important. Of course it's important sometimes. But when literally no one knows how many we have, when literally no one knows which contradict others, when literally you can find virtually no one in this city who actually can say, yeah, 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 I know all these regulations make sense. Because how is it that regulations get put together? You know what happens. Somebody finds a problem. And they say, I need to fix that problem. And that particular problem may need fixed. And that particular regulation might make sense. But boy, you add it up with everything else over and over and over time. And pretty soon, together, none of it makes sense. We need a full-scale regulatory review. Now, those policy prescriptions, I do not think are partisan. You may or may not believe that they are possible. But as we approach the 4th of July, I would close by saying this. This is a unique nation in the course of human history. It is a unique nation in the course of human history because of that radical idea that everyone has potential, that everyone deserves the right to fulfill their potential, that everyone deserves a chance, and maybe a second chance, and a third chance, or even a fourth chance. And the thing that makes that radical idea come to life in addition to political liberties and protections, is entrepreneurialism. The ability to imagine a future and then to build that future. We have so many problems in this world and in this country, where one in six people live in poverty today. We have so many opportunities to compete, to lead, to win. Human capacity is limitless, but human potential is too rarely fulfilled. So on this 4th of July, what I am hoping is that in addition to the great founding fathers who had the genius to imagine this place, in addition to the veterans who have died and fallen and fought to preserve this place, that we will celebrate the entrepreneurs and the innovators who made this place. Thank you so very much. Thank you. You get to stay up here and uh, oh, okay. answer a few questions. We've got a lot from our audience. You talked in your remarks about immigration reform calling for something to be done. Do you support the comprehensive immigration reform package that the Senate passed last week? So the short answer is yes. Uh, I think it must be comprehensive. Um, I think there are some things that the House can and should and hopefully will do before it passes something also in a bipartisan way. Uh, for example, I. I totally understand why people want someone other than the federal government to say, yes, the border's secure. On the other hand, I think we're pouring enough resources out at the border based on the Senate bill that it should be quite easy for a governor to say, yep, my border is secure. So I hope that people will recognize that reform by its nature always requires compromise. I hope that people on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers will not get too hung up on taking credit for anything, but will instead conclude that, as the Chinese proverb says, success has many fathers and failure is an orphan, and to embrace the fact that what we have today is the worst of all outcomes. We have to have reform. And on tax reform, we know the housing market is still recovering from the crisis that set off the larger crisis that our economy has been in for a number of years. You talked about eliminating all of the tax credits and starting from scratch. That would, of course, include the mortgage 
deduction. How would that, um, if you eliminated the mortgage deduction, how would that uh, keep the economy from going into another housing crisis? Well, see, the nature of that question is a perfect illustration of why I say we should start with a blank slate and why I think Baucus and Hatch have it right. Because, of course, there is a justification for virtually every deduction out there. And I can stand here and make a wonderful case for the home mortgage deduction, or I could also say that mostly that deduction is most useful for people who have not just one home, but two homes. But the point is, through a process of starting with a blank slate, now the burden of proof is on who can muster the political will to put a loophole back in. Maybe there will be enough political will to preserve the home mortgage deduction that it will be preserved. And that would be okay with me. But my bet is that 80 plus percent of the deductions and loopholes and complications in our tax code today will not be defended or preserved. And if we could get rid of 80 percent of them, that would be huge progress in my mind. So it's the process that matters because it will cause a different outcome than saying, let's have a political process to debate who loses their deduction. That's a political free-for-all that will not end in the right outcome. The questioner asks whether entrepreneurism and innovation are actually linked. The questioner says, much of the world, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, is overflowing with entrepreneurs and small business, but there's little innovation. On the other hand, Israel has a stifling bureaucracy, but lots of innovation. What's your take on that? I think it's a really interesting question. Um, I think, in part, the question illustrates the link between democracy and innovation. And I believe there is a link. Political liberty is linked to economic liberty. One of the reasons that China, as an example, has difficulty with innovation is because the innovations threaten the political institutions. One of the reasons that Singapore now struggles with innovation is because their society, while there is much about their society and their nation that I deeply admire, it is, by their own admission, a society that has celebrated conformity. Innovation is not conformity. Innovation is disruptive. Innovation is by its nature revolutionary sometimes. Disruptive, revolutionary ideas generally don't happen in a politically constrained environment. And if they do, they are threatening in a politically constrained environment. And that is why, to me, it is the genius of this place that political liberty and entrepreneurialism are two sides of the same coin, although both are a fundamental human yearning. There's been much reported recently regarding the government's handling of personal data belonging to Americans and others. President Obama says he's trying to balance national security against privacy. How well do you think the administration is doing with that? And should individuals have any confidence that their best interests are being well guarded? So let me take it out of the context of President Obama and his administration and generalize my answer a bit, because it is what I believe. Remember the old saying? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. To me, the question that is raised by the NSA, the question that is raised by the IRS, is how is it that we should hold these vast, complex, opaque institutions accountable? How is it that effective oversight is possible. How can we possibly know that if a few people with vast power, whether it's honestly the Federal Reserve Chairman 
or the head of the NSA, or the, how can we know that they are always competent, ethical, well-meaning? The point is, I think we need a fundamental re-examination. I would hope, on a bipartisan basis, prompted by these events at NSA and IRS, we need a fundamental re-examination of how do we conduct effective oversight? How do we hold these institutions accountable? And perhaps in the course of that fundamental re-examination, we will conclude that sometimes there is just too much power invested in too few people. And sometimes bureaucracies have simply become so large, so complex, that they are unmanageable and we need to do something different. Those are the profound questions that I hope will be raised by these twin events this summer in Washington. On the cybersecurity front, last fall when he was still Defense Secretary, Leon Panetta warned that the nation was facing the possibility of what he called a cyber Pearl Harbor. He said that we're increasingly vulnerable to foreign computer hackers and they could put our nation's power grid, transportation systems, financial networks, et cetera, et cetera, at risk. Is that true? And if so, why haven't we done a better job to protect against this threat since the solution probably involves a partnership between government and industry? So I think it is true. Uh, I served for a time as the chair of the external advisory board at the CIA and on the defense business board. I have top clearances. Um, there is no question that the Chinese invest heavily in hacking all kinds of things in this country from business to industry. There is no question that cyber espionage has been a tool of the Chinese and others for some time. There is no question that uh, it is the new front, the new face of 21st century economic as well as um, political conflict. Um, I agree with the questioner that solving any one of these big problems requires private-public partnership, cooperation between the private and the public sector, and I think there has been a fair amount of this. I'm also encouraged by the fact that there is a huge community of entrepreneurs here in the Northern Virginia area who are focused on the cybersecurity threat and from whom we might, uh, over time, see some terrific inventions that will help keep us ahead of this threat. But the first step towards solving a problem is always to speak it <laughs> publicly. So I'm encouraged that we are actually saying publicly, we have a problem, China is part of the problem, and by the way, there, whatever you think of the NSA program, there is no equivalence between what the Chinese are doing in this country and around the world and the NSA program. And so let us not allow anyone in this country or around the world to say, well, see, the U.S. are doing it too. It is not equivalent. A young person in our audience asks, how have you combined passions in the for-profit world and non-profit world? And how would you suggest those of us who are beginning our careers balance both of those? So you know, one of the things that I find so encouraging is the number of young people who are going into what are known today as social enterprises. Enterprises that aren't exactly for profit, aren't exactly not for profit, but are something in between. They are investment opportunities that are focused on achieving not only success, but doing good. Um, the truth is that there are too many businesses that miss the opportunity to do good while they are doing well. And there are all kinds of opportunities in business to do good 
while at the same time doing well. It's true of the corporate partners we have at Good360, companies that are doing well but also doing good. We had a whole series of investments when I was at HP that was really focused on building communities, doing good in the community, but we got something out of that too in better employees, better partners, better customers. So businesses can do well and do good. It's likewise true that there are some philanthropies and charities that are animated by passion but are not sufficiently disciplined about how they run their operations. And if you are trying to do good in a community with donors' money, you need to be thinking really hard about spending every single dollar wisely and well. And so the discipline that comes from business, I think, is incredibly helpful in philanthropy. And the heart of philanthropy, I think, is helpful in business. To a young person, I would say this. I mean, my life is not exactly the right um, um, roadmap. I can tell you my parents were exceedingly concerned when I dropped out of law school. They were concerned again when I went back to work as a secretary. They were really near panic-stricken when I quit that job after a year and ran away to Italy to teach English. So, um, but here's what I would say if you're a young person. Don't worry too much about what your first job is. Work hard at every job. There is no substitute for hard work. And the person who is most likely to get promoted wherever you're working is the person who's doing a really good job at the job they have. But find where your heart is. What excites you? What do you have fun at? What's your passion? Because you're not going to be any good at something that doesn't really get you going in the morning. As far as your next career move, uh, <laughs> as noted in the introduction, you were asked on television whether you might run again for elective office, and your answer was never say never. You noted then that there's a new opportunity because now you live in Virginia. We're here at the National Press Club where we like to make news. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, tell us if you have any interest in trying again for elective office. Sorry, I won't make news today. <laughs> But I do believe never say never. I, I have a wonderful opportunity in my life. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm a cancer survivor. We lost a daughter uh, in the last several years. I know how fortunate I have been in my life and how blessed our family has been. And I know how short life can be. And so for me now, it is about how do I make the biggest contribution I can in the thing that gets me going in the morning, which is to unlock human potential, help people unlock their potential. So for me, that's about can I be associated with not-for-profits that help do that? Can I help restore the entrepreneurial spirit in this country? Can I help women fulfill their potential? Women, the most underutilized resource in the world. Can I help develop leadership and organizational capacity with those organizations that I work with? And I have also always believed that when opportunity knocks, you need to answer the door. So never say never. <laughs> that leads in well to the next question, which is Sheryl Sandberg's book and the advice it contains to lean in has generated controversy this year, perhaps more than uh, Ms. Sandberg anticipated. As someone who's made empowering women a priority, what's your take on what she had to say? So Sheryl Sandberg is a good friend of mine, and good for her that she has decided to spend her time and her talent and her money to help inspire other women. There are some things that I disagree with her on, however. Um, one of the things that um, it was kindly mentioned in my introduction, you know, I was number one most powerful woman in business for six years in a row. It was a great honor, of course. But every year, I would say to the editors and publishers of Fortune magazine, why are you doing this? Why are you rank ordering women one to 50? 
If you want to celebrate women, wonderful, good. But don't rank order us. Like uh, business is, you know, the golf ladder or the tennis ladder. I mean, this isn't sports. This is the game of life. And in the game of life and the game of business, it's better when everybody gets to play. The thing where I disagree with Cheryl is I think it is about women and men, but let's talk about women for a moment, fulfilling their potential. Sometimes, it is true, women become risk averse. They don't want to take a chance on a job they've never done. I know when I took various jobs, people would always say to me, don't take that job, don't take that job. I mean, it's too risky, it's too, you might fail. What I found out was that when you go into a job that's really messed up, if you fix it, people notice. So it's true that sometimes women are risk averse, but on the other hand, some women don't have the opportunity to take a risk. They're single mothers trying to raise a couple kids. They, they don't get to take a risk. They have to think about other things too. Sometimes men are not willing to take a risk by hiring someone who's different from them or listening to someone who has a different point of view. I think feminism is when every woman and any woman has the opportunity and the tools and the chance to live the life she chooses. Not every woman will choose to become a CEO. Some, woman, some women decide to give back to their communities in ways that are unheralded and unsung and yet have a huge difference. Feminism is when every woman has the opportunity and the tools and the chance to live the life that she chooses, whether or not men approve or would make the same choice. There may be more women CEOs, a few more women, uh, but technology managements and boards are still dominated by men, mostly white men. Do you think this will change in the next 10 years? Why or why not? So it's an interesting dichotomy, actually, when you look at American business today. On the one hand, when I became the CEO of Hewlett Packard, I was the only woman running a Fortune 50 company, actually. And, you know, the press attention, the scrutiny, and the criticism were unbelievable, unanticipated by me as well. Today, IBM's run by a woman. Hewlett Packard's run by a woman. Yahoo's run by a woman. Xerox is run by a woman. Pepsi's run by a woman. I mean, the list goes on and on. It's wonderful. And yet, and yet, less than 20% of board members are women or people of color, and that statistic hasn't moved in 10 plus years. It is true that technology is still dominated by men. It is true that the financial sector is still dominated by men. So it's funny, because on the one hand, progress, and on the other hand, not so much progress. And I think the reason for that is because we're coming up against it. It is no longer that there aren't qualified people in the pipeline. It's no, remember, it used to be, well, they're not qualified. Okay? Then it was they didn't have enough experience. It's not that. I think now we're coming up against what it really is. And what it really is, is people have to take a risk. They have to take a risk on someone they don't know. They have to take a risk on someone who thinks differently than they do. They have to take a risk on someone who will challenge them. They have to be prepared to have an environment that is sometimes uncomfortable. But you see, I think diversity is a business imperative. It's not a nice to do anymore, although many people think it is. It's about being inclusive, it's about being, doing the right things, yes. But more fundamentally, it's a business imperative. It's a competitiveness imperative. I know, I've sat around lots of tables where decisions were made, all kinds of tables with all kinds of people. And I will guarantee you this, if you have a group of people that is mostly alike, they think alike, they look alike, they probably have known each other for a while. You're gonna make a decision, but it will not be as good a decision 
as one that is made by a group of people that are different from each other and challenge each other. And by the way, that decision-making process is going to be a little messier, a little harder. There's going to be some conflict, but you're going to end up at a better place because you will consider more alternatives. This is China's great vulnerability going forward. They all think alike, at least those in power. So I earnestly hope that it will get better in 10 years, but I believe it will not truly get better until people understand this isn't about a nice to do. This is about we have to do it to perform at our best as a nation, as companies. We are almost out of time, but before asking the last question, just a couple housekeeping matters to take care of. First of all, I'd like to remind you of our up next luncheon speaker, who is going to be Jim Rogers, the president and CEO of Duke Energy on August 8th. Secondly, I would like to present our guest with the traditional National Press Club coffee mug. Thank you. Thank you. And for the last question, let's go back to your speech. You've worn a lot of hats during your life so far, and you've seen regulations from many different angles. If you could choose one, only one, federal regulation to rescind, what would it be? Oh, only one? Just one. <laughs> it's probably cheating to say, you see, that's the wrong question. It's not the one that's the problem. It's the hundreds of thousands that's the problem. So I don't know how to answer that question. But what I guess, if I had to wave a magic wand, here's what I would wish for. I would wish that our elected representatives would come to this city every day and instead of thinking about all the people that they think about who have offices here in town, they would come to work every day and think, what am I going to do today to help unleash and unlock entrepreneurial potential? What one regulation should I get rid of? I can't think of one, but they know what they are. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Thank you to our audience. I would also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including our Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for helping organize today's event. Finally, here's a reminder. You can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. And if you would like a copy of today's program, please check out the website at www.press.org. Thank you. We are adjourned. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Angela Greiling Keen. I am president of the National Press Club and a reporter with Bloomberg News. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists, committed to our profession's future through programming with events such as this while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org backslash institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker today and those of you in our audience. Our head table includes guests of our speaker as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, I'd note that members of the general public are also attending, so it's not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and public radio audiences. You can follow the action today on Twitter using the hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer period. I'll ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guests. I'd ask each of you to stand briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Kevin Wensing, retired US Navy captain, now with the Sequoia Group. Lynn Cooper, weekly technology contributor to Black Enterprise and founder and chief social officer of Socially Ahead. 
Christopher Chambers, Professor of Media Studies at Georgetown University. And so, like so many in my situation, I decided to go to law school, with all due respect to all the lawyers in the room. The only thing is I hated law school. And so I quit after a single semester, and in order to make a living, I went back to doing what I did while I was in college to help pay my bills. I was a heck of a typist. I went back to work as a secretary. I typed, I filed, I answered the phones for a little nine-person company. I have traveled all over the world, and it is true still to this day that it is only in the United States of America that a young woman typing and filing for a nine-person firm can soon, it only took 20-something years, become the CEO of one of the largest companies on earth. That is only possible in the United States of America. And it is possible here not because I'm so special. It is possible here because this place is so special. And it is so special because it was founded on a radical idea. An idea that was radical in 1776, but it is still radical to this day. And the idea is that every human being has potential. That everyone has the right to fulfill their potential. That it doesn't matter who you are, or where you come from, or what you look like, or what your last name most powerful woman in business. It was during her tenure at HP that the company acquired Compaq Computer, creating the world's largest personal computer manufacturer. After her departure, HP failed to capitalize on the move to mobile products as consumers' preferences shifted in favor of tablets and smartphones. Politics has also been central to our speaker's work in recent years, having played key roles in the Republican presidential campaigns of both John McCain and Mitt Romney. Ms. Fiorina ran unsuccessfully in a bid to unseat Democratic Senator Barbara Boxer in California, but she was triumphant in the biggest battle of her life as a survivor of breast cancer. During a recent interview, asked whether she might run again for office, she replied, never say never. She received her bachelor's degree from Stanford. She dropped out of law school, but made up, more than made up for that, by getting an MBA from the University of Maryland, as well as a Master of Science in Management from MIT. Since we are here at the National Press Club, we should mention as well that our guest is a best-selling author, having penned the memoir, Tough Choices. She was also a contributor to the cable channel, Fox Business. So what's she been up to lately? Ms. Fiorina is now chairman of Good360, described as the world's largest product philanthropy organization. Based nearby in Alexandria, Virginia, Good360 was founded three decades ago, assisting firms to donate slow-moving, obsolete, or seasonal items to thousands of charitable organizations. These items include clothing, books, toys, personal care products, office and school supplies, and computers, among other things. We today will hear more about that work and please help me welcome to the National Press Club, Carly Fiorina. Thank you and good afternoon. It's great to be with all of you, to have met already some new friends and to also see some old friends here as well. I was recently asked what I thought an entrepreneur was. In fact, a member of the press corps said to me, what is an innovator? And I had to think about that for a moment. But my answer was, an entrepreneur, an innovator, is someone who can envision a different future. An entrepreneur is someone who dreams big and works long hours. An entrepreneur is someone who sees possibilities, and by seizing those possibilities, creates possibilities for others. And because it is almost the 4th of July, I also thought on the way here about what makes this country great. What's so special about this country? 
As you heard in the introduction, I began my career as a young adult uh, as a secretary. I graduated from Stanford University with a degree in medieval history and philosophy in the middle of a recession, <laughs> which meant that I was all dressed up and nowhere to go. Cindy Halbert Berlin, President and CEO of Good360. Skipping over the podium, Myron Belkind, the National Press Club Vice President and Adjunct Professor at George Washington University and the former AP Bureau Chief in Tokyo, New Delhi, and London. Skipping over our speaker just for a moment, Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief for Bankrate.com, the 2011 National Press Club President and the Speakers Committee member who organized today's event. Thank you, Mark. Tam Harbert, freelance journalist covering business and technology and the chairwoman of the Press Club's Freelance Committee. And Alan Schlafer, president of the Wharton Club of Washington, D.C., and the member who assisted in making today's luncheon happen. Our guest today enjoyed a fascinating and successful career involving technology, politics, and most recently, as you will soon hear, philanthropy. As many of our National Press Club members know, one of our priorities this year here at the club is to celebrate women's roles in our society. And so I'm particularly pleased that our guest today, Carly Fiorina, agreed to participate in our historic luncheon program. Born in Austin, Texas, Ms. Fiorina's own career began as a secretary working in a small business. What a journey she's had since then. As chairman and chief executive offer of officer of Hewlett-Packard from 1999 to 2005, she was the first woman to lead a Fortune 20 company. For six straight years, she was named Fortune Magazine